Sometimes a decision made in an instant can drastically affect the lives of those around us. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of caring people who make a difference on Rescue 911. We begin on July 8, 1989, at a resort in central Oregon where 18-year-old Palmer Malarkey was enjoying his first week at his summer job. I'd just been telling somebody that Palmer had the ultimate summer job, being a lifeguard. Another lifeguard on duty that day was B.J. Heinrichs. I was down in the um, shallow end. Palmer, he was down watching the deep end. As most lifeguards know, when you got a lot of people in the pool and you're trying to watch everything, um, it's really hard. It was Mrs. Samee's second summer at the pool. I was on the early shift for lifeguarding that day. Two little boys came over to me and they said, Missy, I dropped my goggles and they went down into the drain. So Palmer, when the area he was guarding, it got, it kind of cleared out. And so he said something about looking for the goggles that those two little boys had dropped. <laughs> I saw him dive in, I didn't think anything of it. You know, well, Palmer's diving in, maybe he's hot or whatever. I didn't see Palmer, so I was kind of thinking, oh, well, maybe he got up and walked behind us, and we just didn't notice that he got out of the pool. I leaned forward, and all I could see was Palmer at the very bottom of the pool, and he wasn't moving. I looked down at BJ. All I had to do was look at him, and he knew there was something wrong. I went down and I looked at him, and the first thing I thought was, Palmer, what are you doing? This isn't real. Come up, you know, come up. I gave him a, a couple hard tugs, and he wouldn't budge. When we continue. He has to breathe. He has no air. So I gave him the rest of the breath that I had in me. I didn't know if he was still alive. 18-year-old lifeguard Palmer Malarkey had become trapped underwater when his arm was caught in a pool drain. When his friend and fellow lifeguard V.J. Heinrichs dove in to help, he was unable to free Palmer. That's frantic. I ran for the phone. 911 emergency. Yes, this is Missy Anna Cajal. Missy's call came into the county communication center at 1.49 p.m. Okay, Missy, we're dispatching for an ambulance now. Station 800, ambulance and QRT. The male subject trapped in the pool and the water for approximately two minutes. Dispatch clerk. I started panicking and pulled another time, came to the surface, and I'm gasping for air. Turn the pumps off. And then somebody goes, you know, turn off the pumps. I didn't know if that was going to work or not. It was just like, just turn off the whole system. I didn't know if he was still alive. And I'm like, he has to breathe. He has no air. So I gave him the rest of the breath that I had in me. BJ had already turned off the pump. I guess the pump had not stopped pulling because he still couldn't free him. 
He wasn't moving, there was no bubbles, there was nothing. Off-duty paramedic John Fowler was at home, only four blocks away, when he heard the ambulance dispatched. His arm seemed to be stuck, but it immediately came free, and we proceeded to the surface. In the back of my mind, I was afraid that this person was dead, and there was very little we could do for him. You guys, help get him up! Is he okay? Come on! Get him up! Get him up! Turn him over! Get him up! Turn him over! Palmer had been trapped underwater for nearly six minutes. I've never seen something like that before. There's nothing there. It just seemed lifeless. I started giving an abdominal thrust to the stomach, trying to get some of the water out of there. And then we started CPR. Fire Chief Darrell Churchill also responded from his house, less than a mile away from the pool. In about the first minute uh, that we had Palmer out of the pool, he did regain a spontaneous pulse. Got a good pulse. Come on, Palmer. Even though he was breathing and had a pulse at this point, there was still a lot of concern that this individual could actually proceed to go down the hill and actually end up dying again. That was our major reason behind going with the helicopter transport. They took him away in the ambulance, and I was just thinking, you know, what's supposed to going to happen from here? started to go into a seizure. This young man's already been without oxygen for the six to seven minutes, and now he's biting the, the one clear airway that we have going to him. Having seen a lot of life and death situations, we try and not get real personally caught up in it. But it was, it was a real personal thing for most of the people involved. Palmer was loaded into the chopper and placed in the care of Chief Flight Nurse Julie Mullen. Now, Julie. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, we are in route to the hospital this time. We should be there in about uh, five minutes. Palmer, it's okay. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. Palmer's condition okay. continued to deteriorate. The only thing I could think of is what more can we do in this helicopter for him? There is um, a medication that physicians often use for people with brain injuries. Frequently it is not used in the near drowning patients. I knew I should probably consider this and I called Dr. Bell at medical control. We're bringing you an 18-year-old male, apparently victim of a near drowning accident, fresh water. I'm seeing signs uh, of some brain swelling. I'd like to, to ask Dr. Bell for permission to administer mannitol. Yeah, Julie, give 100 a mannitol IV and call me back if there's a change. If the brain swells, it's got no place to swell to, and that puts pressure within the brain, which further injures it. And we gave him mannitol to cause the brain swelling to diminish. Dr. John Bell was on duty at the emergency room of St. Charles Medical Center. The first thing we did was paralyze him. We gave him a drug that, that intravenously that, that paralyzed him completely. Frothy pulmonary edema fluid coming out, and that's all I know at this point. He was consuming more oxygen than he really needed to be. We wanted to quiet him down. Palmer was still in a coma when Missy Stamie got to the hospital. I knew I probably wouldn't be able to see him, but I went anyways. A nurse came out to talk to me and she said that Palmer had regained consciousness. He couldn't talk, but he was making eye contact with people and they didn't see any signs of brain damage yet. So that was definitely the happiest moment. We walk in the door and Palmer's laying down and he, he looks up at me and he smiles. And it, was just, it was just like, wow, Palmer, you know, you're there. When I first came out of it, the priest was talking to me and he uh, asked me if I had any brain damage. So I had to turn to the nurse and ask her if I had any brain damage because I wasn't quite sure. And uh, she didn't know. She said, I don't know. Well, I don't think I do. So I took care of that question. It has been almost a year since the accident. What we found out as a family 
is that you should not take life for granted because it can change in seconds and you don't have it. Life is a very precious thing and uh, you don't know how precious until you almost lose it. I think children are, are meant to cope with our death and, and that's just a natural thing in life and I have, um, I don't know how I ever would have coped if Palmer would have died. I'm very glad to be alive because uh, life is amazing. This, this earth is amazing and life is full of magic. I was given the gift of life, which is magic.